Uh, hello, 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 and welcome once again back to CM Educators in Malim Juno Gutu. Uh, in this uh, class, we have been this. Uh, we have been tackling many, many different topics. So we looked at our introduction to chemistry. Uh, we went ahead to explain different and uh, define different terms: uh, drug and drug abuse, chemistry itself. We moved ahead to the classification of substances. So we are still in that topic, so we are winding up with the uh, subtopic uh, pure substances. So we say a substance is pure if it only consists of one component. A substance is pure if it only consists one component. We are familiar with uh, clean water, and uh, we had an experiment where we saw that uh, if you filter muddy water, the filter is clear. Uh, now the big question that you're asking yourself is this clear water pure. So we've come up many substances that we tend in some time to say that they are pure, yet in real sense they are not. So it is clean water from rivers, streams and wells pure. Uh, often it is difficult to tell by just mere appearance whether a substance is pure or not. So a substance may appear as one, yet it is a mixture or two or more substances. And uh, we have number a number of uh, methods where we can use to, to, to test the purity of a substance. So we can use the melting or boiling point to test the purity of a solid or liquid. So a pure substance melts and boils at a definite and sharp point. So, a uh, boiling and melting point can be used to test uh, the purity of a substance. It's either solid uh, or liquid. And uh, the, now, the, the substance that uh, we'll be now testing in an experiment, that we have an expected, uh, expected temperature where it will uh, melt or boil. When now it melts or boils lower or higher than what is expected, uh, that one means that it has an impurity. That one means that it has an impurity. So let's look at the criteria of purity. The criteria of purity can uh, simply be defined as, as a method, as a method of uh, a method used to test the purity of the substance. So remember that we are testing the purity of either solid or liquid, and we are saying that the method you can use is either boiling point or melting point. So one of one of uh, either melting or boiling will tell us when a substance is either pure or impure. So we have here an experiment that we can be carrying out to determine the melting point of naphthalene. So we expect naphthalene to melt at 80 degrees, and uh, now uh, our expectation is, is, is 80 degrees. When now it melts lower than 80 degrees, we we'll say it has. Means it has an impurity, so it is not pure. So the apparatus and the chemicals that we require are the following: you have a thermometer, a boiling tube, a beaker, standard club, a melting point tube. You have a stirrer. You have a burner. You have an acetylene cell. You have water, and finally camphor. Now this is how the apparatus will be. This is how the apparatus will be set up. This is how the apparatus will be set up. Have a thermometer, have a steer, have a boiling tube, have a melting tube, we have naphthalene, we have water or oil. Now, the, the, the water, well, in this case, you're using water. Uh, that is now a water bath, where we are now, now we are not uh, boiling or uh, we are not providing heat directly to the naphthalene. So it is uh, providing heat through a water bath. And then a source of heat. So the procedure number one is using a rubber band. We tie the thermometer and the melting tube together. Then now uh, we place the thermometer and the tube in a water bath and heat the water gently while steering continuously. While steering continuously. So uh, the, the work of steerer to help it steer, uh, steer uh, now. Uh, then now we note and, uh, and record the temperature at which naphthalene melts. So uh, our aim is to see at uh, the temperature at which naphthalene melts. Now we are saying that 
we, re we, re we note and record the temperature at which naphthalene melts. Now remember, this year, now we are using the, 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 pure, the pure naphthalene to determine its melting point. And then number four, we are saying that we repeat the experiment using a mixture of naphthalene and camphor. And where the camphor in this case, it is acting as an impurity. So uh, uh, after we are done with the first experiment, we now mix the remaining naphthalene with camphor. And again, now we, we, we repeat the procedures. Now we repeat the procedure. So uh, at the question you have to ask yourself, which of the which of the two has a sharp melting? Which of the two has a sharp melting point? And what effect does camphor have on melting point of saline? So you go ahead and explain now what we have observed. When saline is melting, the temperature stops rising. It will uh, only rise again when all of the naphthalene has melted. So, as now we are beginning to heat, as now we are beginning to heat the water, the naphthalene now starts gaining the heat energy, and temperature begins to rise. Temperature begins to rise. As the temperature now rising, now the remember now we had no solid naphthalene. The temperature as, as they are increasing, they are now rising. Uh, the heat energy is used to break the bond between the particles inside the solid naphthalene. As now it is breaking them, they are now they are now slowly, slowly changing the state from a solid to liquid. So the temperatures will increase to a to, to a certain to a certain degree, then stop stop to increase. They will remain constant for some time. Then again, they will begin rising. So. At the, at the point where now the, now the temperature has stopped rising, at that point now, the, the entire naphthalene has reached its melting point. Now, uh, it will increase after all of the naphthalene has done what? Has melted. So we are expecting that at 80 degrees, the, 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 the temperature stops increasing so that the entire of naphthalene melts. Once it, it's already melted, uh, now the temperatures begins to increase. The temperature begins to increase in that now, because we have water uh, having a boiling point of 100, then up in a melting point of 80 degrees. So it means that the difference between uh, the naphthalene uh, uh, melting point and the water boiling point is 20 degrees. Now, uh, naphthalene will continue gaining the heat energy after, after forming a liquid. So, uh, the temperature will begin to rise until uh, it reach, it reaches the the boiling point of the of the of water, which is 100 degrees, and it will stop rising because it cannot go beyond uh, 100 degrees of the water bath. So I think that it will only rise again when all of the lean has melted. Uh, now, when of the lean has a single uh, pure substance melts at 80. Degrees. So that's what you are saying that it melts at 80 uh, degrees. And then an impure substance melts over a range of temperatures, not at a particular point. Not at a particular point. So we do not expect to have uh, the particular point of a melting point of an impure substance. So it will melt over a range of temperatures. And there, there, there is no point we see that, that now the temperature has stopped rising so that the entire of it melts. No, it will just continue melting over a range of temperatures. So if a solid has a melting point of above 100 degrees, we are saying that an oil bath is used uh, instead of water bath. And, uh, keep in mind that water has a boiling point of 100 degrees. So this helps that the, the water, the, the, the substance now in uh, that we are using, it will help it so that to gain more, more, more heat energy and uh, boil uh, and melt beyond that 100 degrees. Now, oil bath will be effective in that if the solid that is melting has a, point, has a, has a melting point of uh, more than 100 degrees, and oil bath is used instead of water. This makes it possible for melting. This, this makes it possible for melting points above 100 degrees to be measured. So it is possible to follow the temperatures of a solid before and after melting. Uh, before and after melting. So in, in that now oil, ha oil has a higher boiling, a boiling point. Now it will be easier for one to, 
to follow the, the temperatures of a solid before and after melting. So the results can be used to plot a graph and uh, produce a heating curve. Now we come up with a heating curve where what at first we had, uh, where at first we had the melting of a pure naphthalene, then the second one we had the melting of an impure naphthalene. So we come up with a, with a heating curve having now noted and recorded the temperatures at which uh, each is it's melting, noted and recorded the temperature. So we come up with a, a heating curve. So remember that they have uh, different heating curves because uh, now uh, pure naphthalene had a sharp and definite uh, melting point while the impure had, had none. So the first, the, first, the first diagram represents the melting point of naphthalene, of pure naphthalene. Then the second one represents the melting point of an impure naphthalene, the melting point of an impure naphthalene. So you can see that uh, we, we have portions where, uh, where on the, in the first one, had, we have portion in the first one. As now it had a point where now the temperatures were rising, had a point where now the temperatures were rising. Uh, then after rising for some time, uh, the temperature stops rising so that the entire of the the entire of the mel of the naphthalene can now melt. Then after the entire of it has melted, now it begins to increase in temperature until now. Until now, the the boil the the temperatures are uh, of naphthalene are equated to that of uh, uh, of the water bath. And we can see that that of our uh, impure naphthalene now in this diagram B that now it has no sharp points. You cannot tell that uh, between this section and this section, there is now the melting point uh, the, of an um, impure naphthalene. No. We can see that now it's just increasing, continuously increasing, continuously increasing, as compared to this one that has uh, portion B and C, where now the temperatures are constant, where the temperatures are, are constant. The temperatures are constant, so we can see that now now the impurities are the lower, the lower the melting point. So the impurities lower the melting point of a solid. So we can go ahead and explain uh, uh, what is happening now. In portion A and B, naphthalene absorbs heat energy and the temperatures increase steadily. So portion B and C, pure naphthalene changes its state from solid to liquid. The temperature stays constant at 80 degrees until naphthalene melts. All the heat absorbed is used to change solid naphthalene into liquid. Therefore, no temperature rise. I remember now, the particles in solid are now held with uh, strong forces. So the heat energy is now being used to, uh, to change the solid from a solid, uh, the, the naphthalene from a solid state to a liquid state. Uh, it's now breaking the forces, now breaking the forces in between the particles. So then we have portion C and D, the liquid absorbs more heat energy, the temperature rises, it stops rising when the boiling point of the liquid is reached. Now when the boiling point of the liquid used is reached, now when the boiling point of water is, is, is reached, the temperature stops rising, the temperature stops rising. Now the heating curve of the impure substance has no horizontal portion because impure substance melts over a range of temperatures. Melts over a range of temperatures. So we can see now that uh, 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 the melting point of now the expected melting point of naphthalene that was 8 degrees, it was attained with the pure naphthalene. But now for the impure, for the impure portion of naphthalene mixed with camphor, it has no uh, definite and sharp temperature. Has no definite and sharp temperature. So you can say that the uh, now the impurities lower the melting point. So now at this point, naphthalene when mixed with uh, camphor, it will melt like at a lower degrees than what it now melted when it is pure. 
Then you have another experiment of determining the boiling point of a liquid. Remember now, the, in the first case, we have looked at the melting point, what the impurities does to melting point. Now this, we are determining the boiling point of a liquid. Uh, in also this one, we will see what now impurities does to the boiling point and uh, or if it uh, the expected uh, than the expected one. So, like for example, when you have a liquid, uh, a water as our liquid, we expect it to have a, a boiling point of 100 degrees. Now, if the boiling point of water exceeds 100 degrees, it will tell us that it has uh, impurities. It has impurity so in this experiment uh, to determine the boiling point of of pure water so apparatus and the chemical required you have boiling tube you have stopper thermometer stand and clamp burner and water itself so boiling bo boiling point is what we'll be using to boil our liquid which is water uh then now uh, that uh we'll have stand and clamp we'll have a banner then you have water then this is how we'll set up our operator this is how we we'll set up operator have a clamp and stand and then now we have a source of heat uh the clamp and stand will be used now to hold the boiling tube that now that we we'll have the water inside it then uh, the thermometer uh, a stopper will be at the top of it then uh, we'll start the thermometer inside the water then uh we begin heating uh, the water. So the setup of apparatus is as shown above. So now the procedure, we say that we put distilled water in a boiling tube and heat. Now remember, we are using distilled water uh, that is pure. Now distilled water is pure. So it's what we are using to test, uh, to determine its boiling point. Uh, so we put distilled water in a boiling tube and heat. We note and record the highest steady temperature reached on the thermometer so we'll be recording the highest steady temperature reached on the thermometer when now the, the water starts boiling so we repeat the procedure using ordinary water and salty water so they are they are after having done that experiment now we, we go ahead and again repeat the procedure but now in this case we are using ordinary water either water from tap water from wells water from rivers then uh, another experiment will have salty water then the question we have to ask ourselves which one boils at a higher which one boils at a higher temperature pure water or tap water so we go ahead and explain the boiling point of a pure uh, uh, this also another uh, experiment that will be carrying out the boiling point of pure uh, of pure ethanol can be determined in a similar manner so also when uh, heating now or when now we are boiling now the ethanol can also be done in the same manner but ethanol is gentle heated to the boiling point using a water bath instead of being heated directly instead of being heated directly because ethanol is a volatile liquid and highly flammable therefore it can catch fire so now while using uh, uh ethanol instead of water we do not uh, heat it directly did not heat it directly but we use a water bath but we use a water bath so we use a water bath because uh the the boiling point of now ethanol is 78 degrees so that will be now easier to trace uh the uh, to trace the uh, the temperatures before and after the boiling before and after the boiling so uh, in that experiment, we also have the setup of the apparatus where you have the thermometer, you have the safety tube here, and now you have the boiling tube, you have the water bath, then you have ethanol inside the, the, the beaker. You have a uh, clamp and stand, then you have a source of heat. Now uh, the, the apparatus for measuring boiling point of ethanol. Now, ordinary water boils at a slightly higher temperatures than distilled water because it contains dissolved substances. So, as we say that it cannot, uh, uh, from just the uh, mere appearance, uh, looking at the substance, you cannot tell if it is pure. So, when you look at the ordinary water, it is clean, yes, it is clear. So, uh, it will be not possible to say if it is pure, but through but now through uh, boiling it, we can see 
that uh, it is not pure because now it, uh, it boils at a higher, slightly higher temperature than the distilled water. Whether the distilled water in this case is the pure, pure water that we are using. So it, it boils at a, at a slightly higher temperature because it contains some dissolved substances. So salt water will boil at even higher temperatures, at even higher temperatures because of the of the salt added. It will boil over a range of temperatures because uh, as water evaporates, the solution is now the as the water is evaporating now, the solution becomes more concentrated and now the boiling point slowly rises. So the boiling point of salt water will rise because now as we are as we are continuing to boil, uh, there is a evaporation of some of some of the water, and now as uh, the liquid now uh, is reducing, the concentration is now getting higher and higher. Now the boiling point of pure ethanol is 78 degrees. If it contains any impurity, it will boil at slightly higher temperature. So we expect that. We expect that the, the, the pure the pure ethanol to boil at 78 degrees. When now it boils at a higher a degree than 78 degrees, uh, it it, uh, it tells us that now the the ethanol is not pure. For from the previous experiments, we can see the impurities raise the boiling points of liquids and lower melting points of solids, and lower the melting points of solids. Therefore, boiling points and uh, melting points can be used to test if a substance is pure. So this is the one of the methods that can be used to test the purity of a substance. So this one falls under the criteria of purity, where we can use either melting point of uh, solids or the boiling point of liquid to determine their purity, to determine their purity. So another method can be used to test purity is chromatography. That's another method that can be used. We not only have a boiling point, uh, the boiling and melting point, we also have chromatography. So a colored substance, if it is pure, it will give only one ring or spot on a, on a chromatogram. If it contains impurities or other dyes, it will give several rings or spots, depending on the number of dyes present, depending on the number of dyes present. So our chromatography can, can also be used to determine the purity of, of mostly colored substances or colored dyes. And now uh, this method, uh, these methods of purity have their, have their applications in now in real life, the application in real life. The effect of purity, impurities on melting point has been used in now we can see that now they have some effect. So uh, they are they are applicable in a real life. In that, in extraction of metals, uh, in extraction of metals. So in uh, one of the metals that we, uh, we use this method of uh, adding impurities so that we can uh, we can lower the melting point is extraction of aluminium metal. The ore containing this metal must be melted first. So it has a higher melting point of about 2,000 degrees. So uh, attaining that uh, temperature of 2,000 degrees requires more energy, which is now too expensive. So an impurity is uh, an impurity called cryolite is mixed with the ore before melting. And, the, and uh, as you have seen, that melting point, melting point are reduced when an impurity is added, lowers the melting point to about. 850. So this one is uh, an uh, economical and uh, reduces the now the cost. So as 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 we have seen, uh, it is now advantageous now in the in the extraction of aluminium in the extraction of aluminium because aluminium has to be melted before now aluminium ore has to be melted so that we come up with the aluminium. Now we are saying that we add an impurity, which we are calling cryolite, so that it can reduce, it can reduce the melting point to 850 degrees, to 850 degrees, which is more economical compared to the 2000 degrees that could have been attained so that we, we get aluminium. So another extraction of our metal uh, is now in the extraction of sodium, where we add calcium chloride is added to the low, to lower the melting point 
from 1465 to 600 degrees. So this is also another economical method where now we get the sodium from extraction from the sodium ore are uh, having added calcium chloride to lower the melting point, to lower the melting point. Another method in countries uh, which are experienced winter, crude salt is poured on the road to lower the freezing point of water. This prevents ice from forming on the road. So water freezes at zero degrees. Water freezes at zero degrees. So with some impurities like salt, if it freezes at a lower temperature, it freezes at a lower temperature. So that's now the advantages of having of having this method. Uh, we can see now that they are now, in this case now they are helping. They are uh, they are helping so that uh, uh, the freezing of of of, of ice. Uh, lowers the freezing and uh, lowers also the melting in now in extraction of metal. So that is makes it to be uh, economically in now uh, extraction of those metals. So they lower the uh, the cost. They lower the cost. So having looked at that, let's go further and look at the nature of matter and the kinetic theory. Nature of matter and the kinetic theory. The nature of matter, let's look at the nature of matter. We saw that matter occupies space and has mass. So we, we define matter as something that occupies space and has, ma and has mass. So it occupies space and has mass. So under different conditions, matter can be can exist as solid, liquid, or gas. So it depends on the condition under which uh, the matter under which uh, it is in. So it can either exist as solid, liquid, or gas. So by now uh, we are familiar with uh, the properties of these three states of matter. We said that solid has uh, has some properties, uh, liquid and gas. They have different properties. They have different properties. So in this in this chapter we learn about what makes up matter. We also learn about the behavior of matter under different conditions of temperature under different conditions of temperature what now will happen uh to the substance that we will be having if it is either solid liquid or gas under different temperatures how it will change if, if it will change and what will it change to so uh we carry out an experiment to show that matter is made up of tiny particles so matter is made of tiny particles so you have a, a apparatus and the chemical that we will need you have a beaker you have a glass rod you have sucrose uh the sugar then you uh, have water you have water so you put about 20 uh cubic centimeter of water in a clean beaker you add a one teaspoonful of sugar we steer the solution and after having steered the solution now, we have some observations that we make uh, after having steered the solution. Now we're asking ourselves, what do we observe? What do we observe? Now this is how the apparatus are set up. We have the beaker, we have the water inside the beaker. Then after having add, uh, put water uh, inside the beaker, we now add the sugar. We now add the sugar and then we start steering it. So, we say that we say that sugar uh, disappears because it has dissolved in the water. Disappears because because it has dissolved in the water. So the the sugar breaks down to tiny particles. Remember now we had crystals of sugar at first. Then we added into into water. We began steering. So steering, we are just increasing the rate at which it dissolves. While steering, we are just increasing the rate at which the sugar dissolves. So the particles of sugar now, after having been placed in water and steer and being steered, they are now they, are, they now break down to other tiny particles that now we cannot see. And uh, now these tiny particles cannot be seen. So the space inside uh, the water or the water particles now, the space between the water particles now can accommodate the tiny sugar sugar uh, particles that now uh, have been broken down to they can now be accommodated inside the water 
particles. Now the space between the water particles. So these particles are distributed throughout the solution. These particles are distributed throughout the solution. Uh, that, that shows that now the water, the, the water has some space. Water itself has some space. So between one particle of, of now inside the water that has small particles now, there are some spaces that can accommodate now the the small and tiny particles of now the the of the sugar that has been broken. An experiment now we investigate the movement of colors or or, or particles movement of color particles in a liquid. So in this in this experiment we want to uh, we want to determine if now there is movement of particles in a in a liquid. There's movement of particles in a liquid. In the first one we have seen that. Uh, a liquid has some space inside it. A liquid has some space inside the particles making it. So because now it has been in a position to accommodate the tiny sugar particles, the tiny sugar particles. So the apparatus and the chemicals that we require, you have a beaker, you have a glass tube, have potassium magnet seven, then we have water. So the procedure that we'll use, uh, we have the, uh, we have uh, the proce procedures that we follow, we put that uh, cubic centimeter of water in a beaker, we place a crystal of potassium manganese 7 at the bottom. So after having placed water in the beaker, uh, after having put uh, water in the beaker, then we place a crystal of potassium at the bottom. So this, uh, we are placing these crystals uh, so at the bottom and now not under we, we do not disturb the class, uh, the beaker, not disturb the beaker. At uh, the bottom of the beaker with the help of a glass tubing. So we use a glass tubing so that uh, we do not disturb the beaker or now the water itself. So we close the end of the glass tube, uh, the glass tubing with the index finger and remove the glass tubing. After having placed it, now we close the end with the a glass uh, with the index finger leaving the beaker undisturbed for an hour. So then we ask ourselves, what do we observe? So we are leaving it for an hour so that to, uh, to observe what happens. So the water slowly turns purple, both the potassium magnet 7, crystal, and water are made of particles. So we have seen the first case that water is made up of particles. And now, in this case also, uh, remember crystals of manganese 7, of potassium manganese 7 are also made up of crystals, of, of particles. And now, the, uh, the potassium magnet 7 is a purple in color. So remember that we place it at the bottom uh, of, of the beaker, of the beaker that is containing water. The purple color of potassium magnate 7 spreads out because the particles leave the crystals and mix with water particles. Remember now there is a motion of water particles, the motion of water particles. So now as the water particles are, are, are moving, they'll collide with the with the uh, with the particles of uh, with the particles of potassium manganate seven. So making it now to be distributed throughout the liquid, making it to be distributed throughout the liquid. So they are distributed throughout the solution, which eventually becomes purple, which eventually becomes purple. So this can be represented in this way, where now we have the particles of potassium magnet 7 at the bottom. Then now we have the particles of water, have the particles of water, that uh, after some time, we can see that now, as the water is in the, the uh, water particles are in the random motion, they are now colliding with the potassium and seven particles. That now they leave the crystal and now mix. They are now evenly distributed throughout throughout the liquid, making it now to become entirely purple. Remember at the beginning now, uh, water was clear and the purple color was only at the bottom with the purple crystals of potassium manganate 7. So the solute uh, particles move throughout the liquid. This experiment shows that the matter is made up of tiny particles. Matter is made up of tiny particles. 
So the potassium and its seven particles move slowly from the crystals into the water because they keep on colliding with water particles as they move. So we are saying that uh, water particles are in random movement. So as they are moving, they are now colliding with the purple particles of potassium manganate 7 and eventually becoming evenly distributed and the color of water turns purple. Uh, now this method uh, or this movement is called diffusion. This movement is called diffusion or the, or the uh, where now the particles of the of the crystals move to now fill the entire of it is we are calling it diffusion. So diffusion in this case means that now the the crystals the the purple crystals now are living from the a region where they are highly concentrated to a region that has the low concentration of it through the help of the movement of the water particles uh through the help of the movement of the water particle so uh, we cut out also another experiment to show that gases so we we've seen that in the first case now we show that our water or our matter it has some tiny particles tiny tiny particles uh inside the particles we have some spaces where it was able to accommodate the sugar tiny particles that are dissolved in the second one now we have seen that uh, it is in motion the particles are in motion now in this case uh, we are or in this experiment we also come to show that gas consists of particles that move particles that move also a gas has particles that move so you have uh, so this is an experiment I want to carry out to see that uh, gases also consist of particles that move. So you have apparatus and chemicals that we require. We have a gas jar, we have bromine, we have glass tubing, we have uh, a glass tubing. So the gas jars uh, will also uh, that are used. Uh, so uh, the procedure using a pipette or glass tubing. So in this case, you're using a glass tubing. We place a drop of bromine a drop of bromine particular into a gas jar. So the gas jar, we name it A. Then we insert another gas jar, we name it B over gas jar A. Remember now the particle of bromine, you have placed it into gas A, and then we have uh, covered, we have inverted another gas B over gas A. So we wait for a few minutes. Then now we ask ourselves, what do we notice? Remember now inside, you only have the bromine particle and now the air and the air all the gases that now are now inside so we are waiting so that we can uh, see what happens so the uh, the question what do we what why do we have to wait for a few minutes so we wait so that we see if the uh, gas particles are uh, if the if the gas particles will be in a position uh to collide with the uh, with the with the brown uh bromine so that it covers the entire of the jar so bromine in a vacuum will spread very fast so uh, uh, then we are being asked to explain explain why so this now how the apparatus will be set up remember now we are using glass tubing uh to place a drop of bromine inside the gas jar now the gas jar that we have been we are, uh, has been placed in uh, the bromine we are naming it as a and then the one that is inverted is now the uh the jar the gas the B. So we say that uh, uh, this should be carried out in a fume chamber. This is the poisonous nature of the bromine gas. This is the poisonous nature of bromine gas. So it should be performed in a fume chamber. It must be performed in a fume chamber. So both gas gas will be filled with a red brown color. So air is colorless. We all know that air is colorless oil bromine vapor is red brown so it is uh, the bromine itself is heavier than the air when the gas of air when uh, when, when the gas jar of air uh, which now is b remember now b is filled with air is inverted over a gas jar of bromine the red brown color spreads up into the in into it after a few minutes uh, the gas in both jars is red brown. So remember, at the first, we only had the red, uh, bromine in the gas jar that we had indicated A. 
but uh, in the gas there B, we, oh, we, oh, we only had air inside. So bromine particles spread, bromine particles spread in, in the air glass tubing. Spread, uh, a bromine particles spread in air. The reason being that they, uh, for this, uh, because now the particles of the air are, are now in motion, so they, 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 are, they are now moving randomly, they collide with the particles of the bromine, making now to, uh, to cover both the gas jets. The reason for this observation is that both air and bromine are made of tiny particles. Now bromine is made of tiny particles. Air is also made of tiny particles, and they are now in motion. Their particles are in motion. So they are colliding with the bromine, then making it to uh, move to cover the entire space. Now remember that we are having two gas gas. Both of the particles are in motion. So as they move, these particles collide with one another and with the walls of the gas. Now they are colliding with one another and also the walls of the gas gas. So this collision causes the particles to change direction. Remember now, as it, as it collides on the wall, it changes position. As it collides with another uh, particle, it also changes the position. So as they are now changing position, they, they finally will, will, will find out that the entire of the gas gas has been filled with the color, with the brown color of bromine. So eventually they become evenly distributed, hence the red brown color. This experiment shows that the gases are made up of particles. The gases are made up of particles. And the particles of bromine diff diffuse from the lower gas jet where they are more concentrated to the upper gas jet where they are less concentrated. This is also called diffusion. This is also called diffusion. So now it is coming from a region where it is highly concentrated to a region where it is low in concentration. That is what we are calling the efficient. Thank you, and we'll and uh, we'll have we'll meet in the next lesson. Thank you, and we'll meet in the next lesson. Remember, remember to like, comment, and share, and also don't don't forget to subscribe.